is Alison Rego. I was born in a small town called Ajmer in Rajasthan, which uh, where my mum's family hails from. My mum and her mum, so two generations. The beauty of a small town today, I realize, is uh, their life was spiritual, school and family. But then we moved to Bombay, where, of course, I believe the values of of people move uh, move with them. So my, my dad used to be in Oman because he had to be there for work. My mum raised my sister and me alone. The advantage of being raised alone, my mum, my mum had to deal with both of us the same age and I was the naughtier one, I was older. So obviously I was reprimanded more, which uh, today I feel is good. But in my growing up years, I felt it was a little too harsh for me. She was most, more tough with me and I got more beaten. I began to resent this when I was uh, about 12 or 13. A friend of mine once told me, she said, you know, your mum's being partial. This was a word I didn't know before. And I began to, to realize that this is what was happening in my life. Now, this was 13. By the time I was 15, life was kicking in already. And I fe today, when I look back, I realized I used this word I heard, partiality, to do my own thing. But it was also something festering in my heart. So I began to resent and hate my mother to a point where uh, when she discovered cancer, I even told her once, you have cancer because of what you did to me. This was the level of, of uh, resentment. So she discovered cancer when I was 13. She passed away when I was 22. Let me share with you a little bit of what happened in these uh, eight years, eight or nine years. So at 15, I was uh, rebelling, uh, going out, smoking, drinking, doing all the things that uh, you don't want your children to be doing. Today, at least, I don't want my child to be doing. I didn't realize uh, how severe it was and the impact of it on my life. So I, I went through college, I did everything I had to do, but I was also doing things I, w I shouldn't have been doing. I was going to church regularly because uh, that's how we'd been raised. My mom comes from a very pious background, so a lot of the things I think that she taught us in our life uh, were today I look back and I realize they were like guiding stars. They, they helped me not to fall uh, a lot more than I could have. I could never do mental math. My mom would, because obviously she had two children to teach and uh, do all the house chores and etc. It wasn't easy to, to, to look after two kids close in age as well as do everything else. So, I, I generally had an aversion to mathematics and I still do, but she would expect me to be able to count on my fingers and uh, to, to be able to calculate in my mind and I wasn't able to do it. And because I think because of her own um, short temperedness, a lot of her anger was displaced to me because I was the one that would, you know, I had more questions. And today, uh, ironically, when I look at my daughter, I look at her and I think that's exactly what I was. And I think I'm able to control myself a lot more uh, than beating her or yelling at her because of my own experience. So things like this. And then I just felt my mom, because of her anger, uh, short temperedness of anger, I'm not sure which one, her, she would beat me. Now, when you, when you beat a child, sometimes even when I have, you know, uh, hit my child a little bit for correction, you may not realize how hard your hand swings. And this caused me physical pain. So from the time I was six till about 12, I remember, I say 12 because my dad returned at 12. You know, my dad uh, did 12 years in the, in the Gulf and then he probably realized it was his time to be with family. And of course, when my dad came back, a lot of things changed because both my parents are opposite. Their whole way of dealing with things and their temperaments are completely opposite. My father never even raised his voice, leave alone hand. So I understand today uh, what my mother did was not, uh, was a bit of displacement of anger, but I can understand in their generation as well, they were not so aware. So she had, she was displacing anger, she was uh, struggling alone. And a lot of the things that happened to me, I believe uh, should not have happened. But today as a parent, I can totally understand and relate to it. My father, on the other hand, is a calm, relaxed, uh, very evolved human being, I'd like to believe, because he's an avid reader. So my father, on the other hand, when he returned, he probably realized uh, what had happened in 12 years. When I say 12 years, it's not like we didn't meet him or anything, but uh, he lived in another, in another country. And when my dad returned, uh, he did just the opposite. Uh, when my mother, if my mother would say no, he would say okay. So for me, I think I began to, to feel uh, a parent in terms of love. Whatever I'm saying, when I look back today, I, I'm very grateful to what my mother did because I really believe today, if you uh, spare the rod, you can spoil the child. But like I said, because of her own uh, bondage or baggage, if that's the right word, she was uh, executing it to me in a rather harsh way. 
you know, I would see my parents quarrel because my mom would say, they are girls, they shouldn't be going out. But my dad was like, if you don't allow people to explore and trust them, uh, they may just rebel. And I believe he's right in his own way as well because he trusted us completely. He allowed us to, uh, to grow. And, and everything he allowed me to do at that point, uh, today at 30, and when I'm 30 years old, I realized that it, it's like an anchor. I would never ever do something wrong because I know at the back of my head my father trusted me. Because I come, like I said, my mother and grandmother are very, came from very pious backgrounds. Uh, right from childhood, my grandma would sing to us uh, hymns like praise him, thank you Jesus. So I've always known, uh, without understanding gratitude, I knew I had to thank. Today I understand attitude of gratitude and things like that. but. Uh, back then it was just, thank you Jesus, praise you Jesus. We grew up with hymns, with cassettes of, um, you know, playing in our house, my mom singing, showers a blessing, uh, bind us together, Lord. So uh, one day at a time, you know, I've heard all these things and I believe whatever you, um, whatever you do repetitively does become a part of your life. And so Christianity was always part of our life. I went through school getting the best Christ Catholic or student award of the year for six years. So all of this was uh, so I believe in spite of me getting beaten up, in spite of me feeling neglected, in spite of me uh, crying whenever I got beaten up and asking God why, because I was between 6 and 10, I don't think at, at, at that age children, uh, you know a child can, today maybe children can, but in our generation we couldn't reason, we couldn't understand, but I really think uh, there was someone with me all the way because in spite of everything I wasn't uh, dropping grades at school. I think. Um, Jesus has always been a part of our life, uh, not whether I realized it or not. We had rosary in our house every evening. We used to go to church, but we, because of our Catholic background, I really believe that uh, because of the spirituality in the family and, and things like that, we never ever fell too far, I believe. You know, even through my rebelling and revolting days, I could have uh, gotten very lost and gone very astray. But something, I, I, I believe it is, it is a higher force and I like to call that Jesus, yeah, was pulling me back. So I was 15 and discovered uh, the whole new world of clubs and bars and because I was very tomboyish, I believe, I never got, I never went totally astray uh, from a woman's perspective, you know, but yet we were parting, we were telling lies to our parents, we were saying we were in a friend's house and we were in a nightclub. Again, like I said, through all of this, a lot of uh, worse things could have happened, but it didn't. And today I'm, I'm so grateful. I, I pray every day. I began to understand that this is what, even if my child should ever stray so far, uh, I pray that God is still walking with her, you know. The pain in me was so alive that I went from being a shy, timid girl to being the opposite. Uh, in terms of I was everywhere, I, I had like, I, I just wanted to be in the spotlight. I think I was craving attention. It was just the anger. I was angry. When I look back today, I realized I was angry. Uh, I don't hold, today I'm, uh, you know, even if someone hurts me today, that kind of anger I have never felt again. Because I guess it was my mother as well. You know, you, I, I, as a child, every child and the mother. Today when I see my child, I leave her and I go somewhere for like a week, like the retreat. I can see, you know, she doesn't want me to leave her. So I understand what I was feeling as the child and I understand what my mother was going through because I'm a mother today. But the anger was so loud that I, I just didn't care anymore. I was like, I'm gonna do what I have to do. You know, you, uh, I just believe that, that uh, you, you know, you, whatever, whatever happens, if it's good or bad, you deal with it. I realized today, uh, if I had the same knowledge and understanding and experience of Jesus that I have experienced in the last 10-12 years, when I was 15, my, my reasoning of the situation would have been understanding. My, I wouldn't have been so angry. I would have had more maturity to understand what my mother may have been going through. I may have had more um, understanding and maturity not to rebel and revolt because I realized when I turned 15, everything she was saying to me was actually for my own good. She was like, where are you going? Who are you going with? What time will you be back? I thought, because I resented her so much, I was like, you don't have a right to ask me this. You didn't treat me right growing up, now don't ask me these questions. Today I realized that everything my dad did was only for our financial betterment. And everything my mom did was only because of her helplessness. But of course at 15, I hadn't, um, I hadn't found Jesus and sometimes I believe that, that God puts us through situations not to push us away but to bring us closer.
So I, I, as much as I would like to have had the understanding at 15, I also believe that had I not to have gone through what I went through, I may not have been in this chair today. So December 2003, uh, around the 28th of December, my mom got very sick. She couldn't, uh, she couldn't even sit. So we rushed her to the hospital and by the 5th of Jan, she was paralyzed. The cancer had reached her spine. Now she's had cancer for 10 years, but my mother is a very strong-willed woman. And uh, one more thing, you know, that, that she always believed that her younger daughter would turn 21. And she always told God, you know what, take me, but only after my Ella turns 21. And that's exactly the year, 2004, uh, 2003, my sister turned 21. So in October, she turned 21. By December, my mom was very sick. And in Jan, she was paralyzed. And uh, when, when she reached this point of being paralyzed in Jan, my father somehow realized that because he's a medical student, he understood that uh, there may not be a, a return of her walking or even alive again. Uh, we didn't know how much time we had from Jan. Uh, we eventually, we did have nine months, but as every day came, we didn't know, you know, we didn't know when my mother, when, when it would be the end. So in 2004 May, my mom's sister, who has been uh, charismatic for a while, uh, her name is Aline, she said, Ali, why don't you come? Let's go to Kerala. The first thing that went through my head was, what is she talking about? I know this aunt is charismatic and I know that, uh, you know, she would encourage everyone to go, but I, I was like, no. So my mom, one day, she was like, go for me. Now, I'm, I, I, in 2004, I was at a, before my retreat, I was at a point where I know you're sick, I know this may be the end, and uh, I'm telling, uh, I'm not rude anymore to you and I'm not, um, uh, I'm not fighting with you and things like that, and we're not disagreeing, but I, in my heart, there was indifference for a very long time. So I don't know if the indifference had gone, you know, but just because it was a sick person, not even because it was my mother, like there was that much of anger and, and hatred towards her. I was like, I'm, I'll go. I just said, yeah, for the sake of saying, yeah. But I called my aunt's daughter and I was like, if your mom's dragging me, I'm dragging you. I'm not going alone. So my cousin who was two years younger than me at that point, she was all of 20. For a second, she's like, uh, I don't think she was ready to go either, but she realized that her mom's making this plan. Now, if I'm getting, you know, I told her, I was like, Sally Ann, you have to come with me. So she agreed. Now, we both have agreed half-heartedly. My aunt is the one who understands why we should be there, etc. On the morning, uh, so we did the retreat September 1st to the 9th, I believe it was, 2004. On the, we have a train at, at four o'clock in the evening from Bombay where I live, where I used to live at that point. My aunt has a minor heart uh, issue and she cannot travel. She suddenly gets a pain and she, on the first and she's like, it's 11 a.m. and we have a train at four and she's like, I'm not coming. I, uh, for a second, you know, I'll never forget that day. I froze because in my mind, I'm somebody that when I decide to do something, irrespective of what has made me do it, uh, I will do it. If I have committed to something, nothing can stop me. I am as strong. I believe I inherit that from my mother as well. So because I said, yeah, for me to go back on my word was a big no-no. But yet in my head, I was like, how will I go alone? So I called my cousin and my cousin's like, my mom is sick, I cannot come. And I'm like, but your mom made this plan, you know, I'm not going alone. So you said, yeah, I said, yeah, let's just go. So we bought the train with three tickets in our hand. Uh, and I told her, you know what, let's go to Kerala. Uh, let's go and see what's in Kerala. There's no, I have no idea what, what Divine Retreat Center is. I have no idea what charismatic is. And I have no idea of the power of this place, you know, because I've never experienced it. We get on that train. The first thing running through my head is, let's try and sell this extra ticket and make a quick buck. Because I was like, you know, I'm, I'm a very practical person. I was like, okay, now we're going, but why waste this ticket, you know? I believe God was already on that train with us uh, for many reasons I'm about to share with you. For one is, we couldn't sell that train ticket until a stop called Coimbatore, which is uh, a few hours away from Kerala, which means for the major part of the journey, uh, you know, we had the ticket and we had the berth. A young boy enters the train. Now, I have read in the past in Kerala, uh, I believe Kerala is the highest educated state in India, but also highest alcohol. So because I have read in the past that for women, you should not uh, get off the train at four in the morning alone. You may just have a drunk rickshaw driver and you know. So I, I'm somebody who is also very careful about certain things. And uh, I'm telling my cousin, now this train is going to pull into Chalakudi at four in the morning and we are two women and your mom's not there. What are we going to do? 
and I believe God was, uh, you know, he, he sent me a sign. At Coimbatore, a young boy gets in, an engineering student, and I, I, I get talking with him and I realize he's standing, you know. So something in me was like, give him the seat. Don't charge, like, it's, the, it's four more hours. Don't be, um, again, my Christian upbringing obviously stopped me from being, uh, you know, the, the kindness in me came out and I was like, you can have the seat. Now, because he's sitting next to us, I said, okay, let's talk to him, you know. So I asked him his name and what, where, where he's coming from and where is he going. And uh, this was the first miracle of my, of my retreat, before my retreat. He says, I, I live in Chalakudi in, in Kerala. And I looked at my cousin Salian and I was like, uh, you know, my hair stands even telling you this now because even in that, I always believed in miracles. I was like, Jesus, this is, um, how can this be that this person is going to the same place and, I'm, and I know in my head, I don't want to get off the train alone, right? So I was like, okay, you can have my seat, but I have a request, you know, can you, we're going to this place called Pota, we've never been, would you be nice enough to just, you know, we'll pay for the rickshaw, but you just drop us and then you proceed on. You know what he turned on and told me, he's like, don't worry, my house, the, 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 the ashram is before my house, so it's not even like I'm going out of my way. I, I don't know, you know, I believe, uh, like I said, God was in, already in the, in the journey with us. This kind soul, uh, uh, we take a rickshaw, he drops us to the gate of the ashram and he proceeds. As we come in, uh, we check in, I mean, we register and things like that. And uh, I know in the back of my head, I'm here uh, in a spiritual place, but I don't know why and I don't know what's going to happen. I know I've come to pray for my mother to get up and walk and be okay again. If I want something, I, I really focus and I believe uh, uh, I put, God gives me, it's a gift, you know, He's given me this gift to be able to channelize all my energy towards something I want, you know, and then of course it materializes. I walked into, our, into Pota 2004 believing so strongly my mother would get up and walk again. Little did I know that I was going to leave with, with a totally different experience, a totally different reality and a totally different life. I don't really remember the first day. But I know on the second day, I made a phone call to my dad to ask how my mom was doing. And my dad says, uh, she has gotten worse. So I left my mom in, uh, in my house. And when I reached Kerala, because the journey was about, it's about three days now by train. By the time I left Bombay and the second day of the retreat, uh, my dad says, uh, she's in the ICU. My heart is racing. I'm like, Jesus. There's one thing we've always known from childhood is that we, uh, I talk to Jesus like he's someone really sitting in the room with us because my mother always told me as a child you know she said when you're doing something wrong even if I don't see you there are two eyes watching you from watching you uh, when I was young I used to actually look for those two eyes not realizing that she's just trying to teach me something you know that God is always there and he's everywhere so I grew up believing that God is everywhere it's not like only in a church or in front of a picture or in a chapel so I was like Jesus like what are you doing you know you've brought me here so far away, you made my aunt sick, you put Sally Ann and me on this train, both of us don't want to come. Okay, one thing good you did is you got us to this place nicely, you know, you put this young boy on the train, we're safe, thank you, but now what? So I hung up the phone and, and human instinct is like, you need to leave. Now I know, once you check in, you cannot check out till the retreat is over, right? So I go to father, it was Father Matthew. And I'll never forget this, like, I felt uh, he looks like Jesus a bit, I feel, you know, with his beard and his whole posture and demeanor. I went to him and I was like, Father, I need to go. And he, he was so calm and he looked at me and said, my child, you have a week. You know, I, I, I don't know. I, I was like, what is he talking about? He's telling me I have a week. Uh, I believe today he was telling me I have a week more with my mother. But at that time, I thought he's telling me the retreat is a week. And I'm like, no, I need to go. You know, I am generally somebody, uh, like I said, because I'm very strong-willed, I may have even uh, fought him and said, no, I need to go. But because I, we grew up with this background of, of respect to priests and nuns, I knew I cannot argue with a priest. You know, I need to just accept what he's saying. So I went back to the retreat and um, I got into the retreat. You know, I, I, I was able to forget the, the hospital scene, the, the mum in the hospital. Um, like I said, again, because maybe my mind was able to, I, luckily for me, I was able to, or oh, Jesus helped me to focus in the retreat. The first, so it was day number two. Uh, at some point in the retreat, uh, when in the adoration, when the Blessed Sacrament was exposed to us, I felt a hand on my shoulder. And I looked at my cousin and I said, Sally, and you touch me. And she's like, no. 
and I thought she's kidding, you know. But then I realized because I I had experimented with so many other things before, I also understand that that I, I could have been imagining, or this could have been real. At that point, I didn't think too much of my experience. Of course, at the end of the retreat, I realized that that was Jesus with his hand on my shoulder, you know, because. Uh, Luckily for me, when I'm in a place, I'm be I'm able to be in that moment. So I was totally surrendering. You know, I was like whatever the priest was, um, the father was saying, I was doing. Second day finished, I uh, went back to, with her to bed. This one experience, but it wasn't um, life changing or anything. The third day, which is the inner healing, I mean, I can never forget this. You know, even when I speak about it now, I can see the blessed sacrament and I can see my mother's face in it. So father began to ask us to. To, to talk about, to think about the one thing in our life, the two people that, or the the one or two people that may have hurt us the most, but the one. So I I said, okay, Jesus, you're asking me uh, to think about the one person. It's my mother, and the father, the father, it was Father Matthew again. He started saying, uh, started making me, re, you know, asking us to think about all the pain, all the suffering. I realized that there were there. I was crying, you know, and as I looked up. I looked at the blessed sacrament and I realized I could see my mother's face. Now, all through this inner healing I thought I'm forgiving her. What he was making us do now I realized was forgiveness. I thought I'm forgiving her and Jesus is showing me her face in the blessed sacrament so that she's going to get up and walk. And I was so happy. I think I think because I forgave her from my heart, I was happy. But at that point I thought I got my answer. She's going to be alive. and you know the father started um, he started talking about different things and he said uh, you know there's somebody in this audience that is going to have an experience when they go back of a funeral now i saw my mother's face in the blessed sacrament and father's talking about a funeral my human mind is obviously rejecting i'm like that's not for me but everything he's saying sounds very much like uh, like my life you know he says that somebody who has cancer will walk again but you know I, i get goosebumps telling you this because i believe today my mother's in heaven okay because i really i i understand today i had to forgive her to let her go you know but at that point i thought ah he's saying she's going to walk and i saw her face so she's going to walk in this world i was so confident about this but i began to understand he's talking about walking in heaven eternal life different things but there were talks and somebody was talking about alcohol and i'm thinking in my mind i am an occasional habitual drinker i'm not a drunkard i don't do anything excessively you know the father uh, he the person or the, it was the father i don't remember who he said alison stop thinking that even one drink is okay when he took my name i, I was like man this is real like i began to understand you know like how does this person know my name at that point the retreats may have had only 60 70 people I'm not I'm not I'm quite an optimistic person I'm not so pessimistic to say he went to the register and saw no how does he know what I'm thinking at that point so because of it's a gift I believe you know optimism is a gift as well I I believe that Jesus um, you know he was really really working uh, uh, he was coming through everything to me you know where the father he took my name and then I was like this is real when the priest took my name in one of those three or four days of that that retreat like somebody touching me on my shoulder me seeing my mother's face in the blessed sacrament then i began to realize that this is something else like something i've never experienced and these three were the major things that happened to me in that retreat the retreat finished and also of course my heart was really light i believed i had forgiven i went back and my mom Uh, was still in the hospital now the journey with my mom you know i, I feel in this retreat i took back something uh, it was the gift of being able to open the bible and uh, i think it's uh, the holy spirit's gift from the holy spirit to be able to open the bible and and find an answer through a verse and i say this today because when i went back to the hospital my mom was already on morphine now morphine makes you completely delirious you don't know what's happening a human being on morphine is is pretty much mentally um, off you know it's just keeping the body alive because you're still alive your heart is beating until god decides so she was on morphine where she couldn't speak to me much she couldn't understand she could understand but she couldn't we couldn't understand her and every communication i had with her for one week was through the bible now my father and sister had been with my mom and this help we had for one week they had no rest nothing 
I went to the hospital and I did three days and nights continuously and I wasn't tired. And I began to realize, you know, that one week of me not being tired after the retreat, that one week of me speaking through the, the Bible, it was the gift, was my way of making up for 20 lost years or 22 lost years. Yeah, 22 lost years. And I really believe that uh, if I didn't have that, if I didn't come to Kerala and I didn't experience Jesus, I don't think I would have been able to live with myself today because my mom died like a week. Um, so this was the 9th, by the 10th, I was back. On the 18th of September, exactly one week, like the father said, one week later she died. Now, I don't believe, you know, when, when you lose, when people die, a mother, father, brother in your family, people are mourning and crying and grieving. I wasn't crying. And it's not because I, I, I didn't have love or anything. I just understood that she was in a better place. I, I, I'm telling you, I have goosebumps even now. It, it's 12 years this year, or 11, this is my 11th year since her death. And 11th year since that experience. But when I talk about it, my hair still stands. So I went back, my mom passed away. My sister was totally shattered. My father was, my father's also, a, I mean, he, even if he's shattered, he knows how to hold fort. But they were really shattered, you know. And God just gave me the strength to become that that binding element, that, that to hold forte. So, Let's come to the funeral because even in the funeral, I believe, you know, like everything Father had said in that inner healing, that there's going to be two hundred, like a lot of people, a big crowd, and you are not going to be broken. And uh, you know, at that point, I, I told you, I, I didn't believe that funeral was for me because I thought she's going to get up and walk. But I think some part of that inner healing, he was actually building, Jesus was building me up for that funeral. And I don't believe I could have done this if I hadn't been in Kerala and experienced Jesus a week before. And even at her funeral, you know, I'll never forget, they took the, we went to the mass and just before they, they bury the body, uh, there's a little prayer. You know, I looked in the sky and I could see, uh, okay, my hair stands, I could see this, this light. I could see my mother, I, I don't know whether it's, a, I, I, you know, I know it, when I tell people, when I told people about this, they thought, you know, it's a fiction of your imagination. I don't believe them because they don't believe, they have not experienced this, but the, I understood eternal life. I understood that. You know what, this, this life for everyone, my day is going to come as well, your day is going to come as well. But this life is only, is only given to us to, to, you know, it's something, it's a gift God gave us and we need to, to do something good about it. Like, I believe the only time that's ours is the, the, day, the dash between our birth and death day. And really what we do in that time uh, is who we are. It's not where I live, which country I live in, what job I have, what car I drive what house I own, how many kids, what achievement, it's none of that. And you know, God has been really good to me, like in my life from, to, from, from, from my retreat until today. Uh, he's put so many great things in my life. I feel God, maybe he, he gave me this experience young so that I, I can learn uh, deeper things in this, in this journey of life that he's given me. So I think, I think the seed of faith is a gift that I've been uh, handed down from my ancestors like my mom, my grandma, and I really hope and I pray and I'm here today because I have a two-year-old daughter and I want to pass this to her. And I understand today I need to walk this path with, with the Lord so that I can, I can only give to my child what I have. You know, I can't give her the Bible and say read or I can't expect her to live a Christian life if I'm not doing it. 2004, um, he gave me, he empowered me so much. He gave me so much of power and strength and faith. I went into this big world and he gave me the best 10 years. Like he, I, I worked on a cruise ship, I traveled all over. He, he gave me things that, you know, I saw a real rocket get launched once in NASA. So I don't believe the average human has these experiences. So I'm very grateful, you know, every day I'm like, Jesus, thank you very much. And keep giving me these experiences, you know, but, but please don't, um, I know he will never leave me, but I never want to leave his hands.